My uh, lecture tonight is uh, The Nature of Health, because as you'll see, uh, what I've learned over time is that uh, everyone has all these questions about health, but if you break it down to one simple statement, that the closer you are to nature when deciding what you put in your body, the healthier you're going to be. And if you usually stick with that idea, you're not, gonna, you're not really going to go wrong. So some of my, uh, again, a lot of stuff you can find here on my website. Um, I have a couple of them. RyanMuscle.com is just going to be for myself and my training. And then I have one, High Tech Yoga, which is being able to incorporate yoga into your everyday life, especially out here in Austin where a lot of people spend a lot of time on computers or they're really busy and they don't have time at home. So just stuff you can do while watching a movie or you know, while at the office. So some quick background information on me, just because I think that uh, there's a lot of people in different industries now who are, are doing stuff and don't necessarily have the experience in it. So I just want to let everyone know kind of what I've been through and um, how I've come to attain the level of knowledge that I have. So I went to a San Ignatius High School in Cleveland, Ohio, and I did ba football, basketball, and track and field, and we won national championships in football while I was there. Uh, I, three of my quarterbacks went to the NFL. Uh, Dave Ragone ended up playing for the Houston Texans. Another one, Tom Arth was Peyton Manning's backup at uh, Indianapolis Colts when he won his uh, when he won the Super Bowl. And then uh, currently, uh, Brian is now uh, possibly going to be a quarterback for the Houston Texans. So he was with uh, Cleveland last year, uh, Brian Hoyer, and uh, you know we'll see. Hopefully he does well there. But he's another one who graduated from my high school. From there, I went on to Emory University, uh, goes out of business school. I did track and field there. I uh, just enjoyed track more than football, just because I kind of felt I had more things in my control, and it was kind of like me against myself, not necessarily competing against everyone else. I did. I got three degrees actually. I did finance, information technology, and philosophy. So a very uh, try to get a well-rounded background. And then I went to UNLV, where I did uh, started doing a master's in kinesiology. And I got about halfway through it. I took some, uh, I had some pretty good teachers for a little bit. I had Mark Philippi, who was one of the world's strongest men. Um, so he had all these huge boulders and all these like big tires and everything back when they were doing that. He was like one of the, the top guys on that show. And then another one was uh, Laura Kruskal, who was the head of the Canyon Ranch Spa. And so some pretty good, you know, health and nutrition classes that I got from them. Ultimately, I ended up only getting about halfway through because I uh, ended up buying a health food store, Pure Health. And we also started a training center, which was the largest gym in Vegas at the time. It was called Pure Formance Training and Event Center. And we actually had the largest mixed martial arts gym in the, in the entire Las Vegas area at that time. We did, uh, we did the show Fight Girls with the Oxygen Channel there. We had a lot of Muay Thai and MMA events. And Card Player Magazine filmed a, uh, did a cover shoot there for uh, All-Star Weekend, we had Nike, EA Sports, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods in, uh, in our place. So it's a pretty good place in Vegas to be able to you know, host a lot of activities and uh, kind of have a lot of fun while doing a lot of the training. And then also the website puresupplements.com where is where I really started getting into the nutrition and supplement industry. And it's really funny because most of the products now that I was selling at you know, Pure Health and puresupplements.com, the ones that are really popular, I don't even take anymore. So it's just kind of funny how uh, the transition has occurred. And during that whole time, I was training uh, to, I was trying to make the Olympic team in decathlon. And so uh, while I was out there, I ended up having a knee injury at one point, and I tore my ACL, MCL, and meniscus. And I thought, you know, my, my career was pretty much over at that time, just because, you know, it was going to be another four years till the next Olympics. And, I uh, ended up doing a lot of, hosting a lot of athletes and celebrities at the clubs. My friends owned a lot of the, the clubs in Vegas. And so a lot of the relationships I had with you know, professional athletes and then celebrities coming in, we were able to host them at the nightclubs, which was kind of fun. And I ended up spending a lot of, a lot of time doing that. But eventually, I really wanted to see athletically where, where I could, if I could come back from that. And so I ended up moving to Florida and working with uh, several different companies, uh, Perfect Competition, Athletes Edge, and Test Football Academy. And we had some of the best athletes in the country at that time. We had a lot of Drew Rosenhaus' guys for the NFL. And you know, we had Dante Stallworth when he was going through his you know, murder investigation. We had Plexico Burris when you know, he had shot himself in the leg in a, in a nightclub. And 
what I really learned during my time working with those athletes is that how much the media likes to spin things and they don't even know these individual players, especially pro athletes or celebrities. And so I think everyone's getting a very slanted view of them because these are guys I work with every day and the media is just going on about what kind of people they are and they don't even know them. I was the one you know, that was there and all the people that I was working with getting to see these guys on a daily basis. And it was completely different from what was being spun in the media. And that's one of the, the main things I learned there. And just as far as my background goes too, I was uh, I have an NSCA uh, certified personal trainer, CSCS certified strength and conditioning specialist for like over ten years, and I don't necessarily think certifications really prove anything. You know, it's great that you have a certification, but at the end of the day, it comes down to your level of knowledge and experience. Anyone can go out right now and you know become a personal trainer over the weekend, and you you know what you know there's yoga certifications you can get, but Anyone with you know knowledge and experience knows that the certification doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's definitely you know something useful to have, but I really focus more on just focusing on yourself, getting yourself better, and then being able to help others after you've attained a certain level. So, one of the things that was really interesting after all of this, when I was in Florida working with all these top professional athletes, I was you know a really top athlete at the time. But one thing, I was having extreme back pain, even to the point where I couldn't even get out of bed sometimes. I would just like lay there for hours, just incredible pain. My hair, I was really losing my hair, um, which obviously isn't a problem anymore. Um, but it was like really short and thinning and everything, and my flexibility was just getting destroyed. And like I had all the best experts in the world at my disposal, and no one was really giving me any useful help or knowledge or anything like that. And that kind of is where... You know, my, my book here, uh, The Journey of a Lifetime, Yoga for the Warrior Athlete, which is about half of it is about my journey, kind of what I just described. And then the other half of it is how eventually I ended up making it back to Las Vegas after all these issues, because uh, I got a good opportunity to work with some other people back there. And I ended up at a gym meeting a uh, stranger who I had kind of seen before. And throughout several of our books, we call him uh, Atlas because he wants to be known more as an archetype. You know, he's an actual person, but he just doesn't, he's not trying to get his name out there and let everyone know what he does. And so we use the, the pseudonym Atlas as, you know, an idea of an archetype, of what a teacher can teach you. And as you'll see through here, you know, I've had some, you know, he's pretty, pretty amazing teachers, and just some of the other different people that we've done. These are some of the books that I've written. So there's my own personal book, The Journey of a Lifetime, Yoga for the Warrior Athlete. The second book here is uh, by Ashley and Lisa Cottrell. And they actually came in, and I ended up working in a, a medical clinic for several years with my uh, really good friend Dave and his uh, wife, Dr. Lisa Wampol. And pretty much doing Chinese medicine, acupuncture, and stuff like that to relieve different, you know, uh, problems that people had. So Ashley actually came in and was doing an interview with myself and Dave to be a yoga teacher because we were trying to hire yoga teachers at the studio. We told her a little about what she did and she's like, oh my gosh, you know, you really need to help uh, her mom, which is on the right side there. And her mom had been working with Steve Wynn for a while, had spent, um, she wants to say close to about a million dollars in insurance money because she has, you know, serious back pain, she was on all these medications, and uh, the first day she came into the clinic, she was on crutches, had just had, you know, another surgery, and, you know, within a very short amount of time, we were able to pretty much reverse all of that, get her off of all of her pain medications, just by, you know, juicing, you know, acupuncture, raw foods, simple stuff like that, and uh, what's really cool is that the, the last chapter in that book, uh, Ashley ended up uh, teaching at another studio, and one day Floyd Mayweather came in and really liked her class enough that he wanted to do a private, so uh, Ashley and my friend Dave went over to um, Floyd's and did uh, you know, some private yoga sessions with them, and there's some really cool stuff in the book there about like what went on, you know, Floyd you know, winning $900,000 betting on basketball during yoga, and just those crazy stories that I uh, sometimes hear, but you know, it's kind of fun to have documented. Uh, the other one, uh, Nick Facchetti here, who was a UFC fighter and had, you know, come into the clinic and had, you know, could barely move his hands and barely walk, and, you know, he's supposed to be one of the top athletes and was just in so much, so injured and so pain, and so 
a really cool journey about him, you know, getting back to getting back his health and then going on and you know winning his next fight. And then Celia's book, which actually I just got yesterday, um, was really cool. This uh, shows how some of the stuff we use to help her overcome uh, her cancer. And also, she had went to three surgeons who had told her that she would never be able to play golf again, and diagnosed her with, with spinal stenosis. And what's really funny is the day before she was going to go into surgery, like you want to talk about how synchronicity happens, she went to Ashley's yoga class as the last day of her membership and the last day before you know she was going to have her surgery and be out of commission for nine months. And Ashley begged her to put the surgery off and to meet these people, and so she's like, "Okay, I'll give it a try." Ends up making an appointment, and you know, not too long later, you know, I think it's like a year later, she's back on the golf course. So you know, pretty much a really cool story here about how you know she was able to overcome everything that they told her she would never be able to do. There's actually a uh, um, a great quote in here is that uh, one of her doctors, he made sure to warn me that if any surgeon or any other kind of alternative practitioner gave me any guarantee that I would be able to play golf again, or that they had the ability to fix what I had, they were damned liars. So, you know, and that was uh, a pretty serious, uh, pretty serious suggestion there compared to what, you know, ended up resulting. And then the main book, uh, which I think is honestly one of the best books ever written on health and fitness, uh, Dave and his uh, partner Elisa wrote Nourishment for the Spiritual Warrior. It was a best-selling book at the Whole Foods in Las Vegas. I think it, in one month it outsold every other book in the store combined. And it's just an amazing thing. Pretty much everything you wanted to know on health and fitness to really get started changing your life, it's in that book. There's nutritional recipes, um, everything from doing cleansing to like what foods work well with other foods and uh, just the best way to start off, some juice cleanses and everything. So, um, as you'll see, I'm going to be picking several different things in this lecture from that book. Uh, just because they did, it took them around seven years to write that book. And last, Andrew's book actually uh, just came out, and uh, I got a copy yesterday. And this shows his uh, journey, a high stakes journey to freedom. Uh, this is a pretty amazing, amazing book. He recently, last year, he won a tournament at the Bellagio. Recently, he won one at the Aria. He's cashed in several World Series of Poker events already this year. And it's just amazing how, if you really look at the top of not only sports, but poker and several other industries, all the same people are doing the same thing when it comes down to what kind of nutrition they're doing, what kind of yoga and meditation. All the top elite you know, people that are having success in every industry you end up noticing patterns and they're all doing the same thing. So it's really cool to see, you know, from the poker perspective that, yeah, these guys are able to utilize this knowledge and they're actually, you know, winning large tournaments by being able to do that. So uh, I just wanted to, a really quick, what we're currently doing, I'm actually enrolled part-time right now, I'm actually doing a master's in sports management and a master's in kinesiology. And it's funny because earlier I was saying how, you know, I don't really think that degrees and certifications and all this mean all that much and some people are always asking, oh, why are you getting these? And the main reason is because I want to be able to, you know, when people say, oh, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, you don't have a master's degree, you don't have a doctorate, you don't have this, I want to be able to be on the same level playing field with them and be able to say, I have all these degree certifications that you do, I can do and experience all these different types of, you know, athletic movements and I work with all these athletes. And so I'm not going to be able to get out uh, out game by the level of knowledge, I guess, that you know, they obtain just because they have a doctorate or a PhD after their name. Um, we're also going to be doing yoga teacher training here. I believe the first one we're going to do is in Iceland. And then I think we're going to do one here in Austin and probably another one in Las Vegas. So, you know, stay tuned for that. Uh, we're putting together the acupuncture Chinese medical clinic here as soon as we, uh, as soon as we get finished with all the building. I'm really excited to I think, be able to bring that here with you know, Dr. Elisa and you know, David and just some amazing people. Uh, the Burke Superfoods line we're now bringing to Austin and they actually sell it here at the at Brave New Books which is really cool. And it's done really well. We actually, the line was originally put together, we just put it together for our patients because we found that most of the stuff that we needed them to have, you know, mega doses of say the probiotics and the enzymes, and these superfoods were just, it was cost prohibitive. You couldn't go to Whole Foods in these other stores, and you just couldn't afford it. It was so expensive, you know, from where the farm was, and then the wholesaler, and then Whole Foods puts their margin on it, and they, the dosages they needed to get the results, 
it was just not possible at those prices. So we really put the line together for our patients, and now we're going to try to start offering it more, you know, to the general public. And you know, obviously, if we have the offices here, one of the main things we're going to do is be able to have those uh, at affordable prices for everyone to be able to use. And lastly, uh, we're in the final stages now. We're going to have the Austin Universe here September 5th, which is the, it's through the IMBA. It's the world's largest drug-tested uh, fitness championship. So we're going to have you know, bodybuilding and fitness and yoga and you know, bikini and um, you know, swimwear and all this really cool stuff. And last year they did it in Chicago. We're moving it to Austin because I think it'll do really well here. And we're down to a couple venues now that we're, uh, we're dealing with. Uh, and it's going to be a really, I think it's a really great thing for Austin to have, you know, something like that here, especially one that's drug tested. Um, so you still get a uh, pretty good high level quality of athlete, but you know, you don't have to worry about these kind of crazy big freaks that are on steroids and taking all this unnatural stuff. I think it's a lot uh, closer to what the average person can attain if you're trying to be in, the, you know, the health and fitness industry. And so from there, as I uh, began uh, the lecture, the, the nature of health, um, the simplest thing you can possibly do right now to change your health and your life is just start putting things in your body that are as close to nature as possible. So, you know, the whole idea, you know, vegan, vegetarian, all this stuff comes out and everyone has their own idea of what it is or what it means. But instead of trying to like just identify yourself with like, oh, I'm a vegetarian and vegans are better than vegetarians and this is better than this and you have to do this, if you just kind of get in the mindset that the closer you are to nature, the better you're going to feel. So instead of eating applesauce, have an apple. Instead of getting you know pasteurized orange juice, just eat an orange. You know, instead of eating ho hos and Twinkies, you know maybe go get a juice at uh, at Juice Land or at Whole Foods. It's those very simple changes that, like, as soon as you're, you know, when you're going to make dinner, when you're going out to eat, if you look at what's on your plate, how many steps has that removed away from nature? You know, has that thing been, you know, killed and then cooked and then this and all this, and pretty soon, like, what you, what you have on your plate, is it anything even close to resembling nature? And so, and that's the big thing that eating vegan and vegetarian foods, you're essentially cutting out the middleman. Most of all the meat that's grown, they're fed, you know, grass or they're fed grain or all this stuff, and all you're doing is you're eating the, you know, the animal that has eaten what you actually need, which is the actual grass or the grains or the actual stuff that it's eating. So, not only is is it spending a lot more, you know, time and energy and everything doing that, eating all the different animal products, but it's actually more unhealthy. So by cutting out the middleman, which essentially is the animal, you're getting closer to nature and you're getting the nutrients that you need. And that's what it is, you're getting high doses of nutrients. Your body needs high dosages of enzymes, probiotics, vitamins, minerals, and anytime you cook food too high, which I'll get into more of the idea of raw foods in a little bit here, um, you know, anytime you're like, no one is really going around eating raw meat and you know, all this raw eggs and everything, because why, because you end up getting sick. And so, in order to get these enzymes, probiotics, vitamins, or minerals, you need to get them from plant sources, or else you have to heat it up and it's cooked and you're killing them. So again, the very basic thing you can start doing right now to start making changes in you know your your life, your nutrition, and everything, just eat things closer to nature. You know, keep it simple. Replace a couple things every day. You don't have to make a crazy change, um, but just know that you're taking some different steps. Um, What's really interesting too, I'm not here, sure if you can see this, this is in uh, David and Dr. Lisa's book, but they actually did an amazing job chronicling almost every major religion and you know, whether it's the Bible and the Quran and all these other different books actually have verses in there about um, you know, eating like vegan or vegetarian and not eating animals. And uh, I'll just pick one out here, it's like, let's see. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, and which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for me. And that's King James Version Bible, Genesis 129. And, um, you know, it doesn't really matter what religion you are. I just think it's really interesting how every major religion, no matter which one you're in, kind of references the idea of eating more, you know, fruits and vegetables and things that come from the earth. And they did an amazing job in their book of chronicling all the different passages in there. And then, 
What's really interesting too, the idea of you know just animals that are vegan or vegetarian, and uh, many of the strongest, tallest, you know, biggest animals actually are primarily vegan and vegetarian. Uh, I'm not going to get into too much now about how just the nature of humans is actually to be herbivores and not omnivores or carnivores. There are some other people, you know, if you want to really get into it and uh, the whole ethical dilemma or the whole proof that you know um, humans are herbivores. I have some links on my website, and then Gary Yarovsky has some uh, very interesting mind-opening videos, and so you know you can check out some of those. Um, but just if you just look around and you're like, oh wow, you know all these people. How do you get enough protein? How do you do this? How do you do this? Well, some of the biggest, strongest, tallest animals in the world are able to get that size through being a vegan and vegetarian. So I I don't think that's a really um, good argument that a lot of people try to bring up, and I've had some of the strongest and most amazing feats I've seen are by uh, some teachers and everything that I know that, you know, Shaolin monks, who pretty much are vegetarian, doing one finger handstand push-ups and throwing needles through glass and breaking metal over their heads. It just some feats that you wouldn't even think are possible, and they're doing it, you know, not by, and they're doing it by being more vegan and vegetarian. And from there it comes to raw foods, and the idea of raw foods is you're not, you're cooking your food, um, and you're, you, you're not cooking it over between like say 105 and 120, so you can use like a dehydrator or just like warm it up. And the main reason for that, again, you're not destroying your vitamins and minerals or enzymes or probiotics. When you heat something up too much, uh, just like freezing it, if you freeze it too much, you're going to destroy all those things. And so the closer you are to nature of getting something originally, you know, getting that apple from the tree or getting that cucumber directly as it comes from the ground, it's going to be more healthy, it's going to be more beneficial, a lot of time it tastes better too. And again, the simple thing with this, raw food, so food that's alive makes you more alive. Food that's dead simply gets you closer to being dead. And that's a very simple thing, so next time you go to the store and you're eating and you're wondering what to get to for dinner, if you just look at the adage, okay, what is as close to nature as possible, and which of these is, is alive as possible? And you're probably going to be doing yourself a good favor as far as taking that next step to getting healthier. And let's see, so another few, another just interesting scientific studies. So, in an experiment supervised by Victoria Butenko and conducted by a university professor, the average IQs of students were found to be raised by 40%, okay, 40%, after only two days of eating 100% raw foods. So if you think about whatever level you're at, according to the study, you know, students, if you eat raw, nothing but raw foods for two days, you'll be 40% smarter. Which kind of is like, um, <laughs> kind of blows your mind to think of, but uh, that's another, and again, all the references are here if anyone wants to look it up for themselves. That's a Shank and Bigwell. Big well. And there's another one, uh, Professor Carl Elmer published an article concluded a 100% raw food diet significantly increased flexibility, stamina, and reflexes in athletes. The study compared athletes' performance while on a cooked food diet to their performance on a 100% raw food diet. And that's just, again, the, just comparing athletes with that same idea of raw food. The live food makes you more live, makes your body work properly. Uh, the you know, cooked food, not as much. And this is another really interesting one. So. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, Dr. Abramowski, an Australian medical doctor. Uh, he had completely recovered his inability to work due to heart ring arteries, and so he decided to try this with his patients. So he took over 100 patients, divided them into two groups. One group was given three pounds of fresh fruit to eat per day and was taken off all their drugs, like that. And the other group was given standard hosp hospital food and drug therapy. So eventually they had to stop the experiment because of all the nurses concluded the inhumanity uh, is what they quoted it, of the experiment because of how much better the, uh, the people that were getting the, the fresh fruit were doing versus the people getting the regular hospital food. They thought it was just so unfair. Um, because, and that's the quote I quote, she said it was clearly killing them the regular hospital food. And this is from actual medical doctors and nurses. And then another really interesting one is, I thought this was mind-blowing, this is the effects of heat treatment on nutritive value of milk for the young calf. And so what they did here is they took, uh, and this was published in the British Medical Journal, so they took, you know, they have, you have a mama cow, 
and she gives milk right to her babies. So what they did, all they did was take the milk from the mama cow that normally goes right to the babies, then they pasteurized it, which by law you have to do to all milk products, and there's many other things here that are pasteurized too, and they simply gave that exact same mother's milk back to those calves again, and nine out of 10 died before reaching maturity after that. The simple process, exactly what every person is doing to themselves if they're drinking milk, the pasteurization, uh, and you see probably so much stuff in the news and everything about the oh, raw milk and everything. We have to look at those raw milk people because it's so bad for you. But here it's pretty obvious. I mean, it killed 9 out of 10 of their own calves before reaching maturity by doing the same thing every person is doing to themselves every day if they're consuming milk. Um, so again, cutting out the, I mean, especially the idea of pasteurization. You know, if you are going to be doing... Uh, stuff like milk and cheese like that, if you're pasteurizing it, I mean, look at the study there. It's not, it's not too hard to realize what it's going to do to you if it did that to those calves. And this is another pretty amazing one. This, uh, Dr. Schizkelli actually did more than 123,600 people on a raw diet. So between 1937 and 1970, that's over 123,000 people. According to his results, over 90% regain their health from raw foods. So that's a pretty big sample size. You're talking over 100,000 people, and then 90% actually being able to get their health back through raw foods. I think that's definitely something worth, you know, worth a try. And so from there, the question is, oh, what can you eat? If you want, to, you want me to eat all these plants, vegan and vegetarian food, and you want me to eat raw food, like, I can't go to the store and eat that. I have no idea what that is. And, one of the first things I like to tell people, if you don't do anything else after leaving here, if you only change one thing, start doing juicing. And not the bodybuilder juicing we were talking earlier, the sticking cucumbers and celery into your juicer and drinking it. So, very simple juice recipes. There are some amazing one on David and Dr. Lisa's book. Uh, the base is, usually we like to have everyone do a cucumber and celery base of at least, say, 50 to 75%. And the reason why is comes sometimes when people get into juicing, they just juice all fruits. And you end up just getting so much sugar, and you're getting sugar crashes, and you know, then that has issues with insulin, and sometimes people with diabetes. But if you keep the cucumber and celery, which is heavily alkaline, and you make that the base of your juice, you can still add in some other fruits and other things that have some sugar in it that taste good, and it'll make the whole juice taste good, because the cucumber and celery on its own doesn't have too strong of a taste. Uh, especially the cucumber. Cucumber almost just tastes like you know plain water and I actually take my distilled water that I have and I put cucumbers in it uh, just because it makes it taste really good. You can throw in some lemon and mint and stuff like that and uh, it actually tastes amazing just to taste. Um, and basically any combination of raw foods and vegetables you can use. There's not really a limit to what you can make. Your imagination you know, is kind of there. But I would have a base of cucumber celery. Throw in whatever your favorite or your taste at the time is of whatever fruits you like or sugars. And you've got juice. And the other thing I'd like to, I guess, kind of dispel myth-wise is you don't need to necessarily juice every single day. So in the beginning, I was actually literally juicing three times a day. I would, and it, took, it did take time, and it took, you had to clean it up and everything, but now, Honestly, I can juice once a week. I'll make several glass jars of juices, and they're good for the entire week. It doesn't go bad. You put it in your fridge. It still tastes good, and you still get all those you know, enzymes, nutrients, and everything. Yeah, if you did juice every day, maybe you'd get that little extra you know, biophotonic energy, and it might be a little bit better for you, but for time-wise for people, just get the stuff into your body. Get as much of the raw you know, food, fruits and vegetables, as much cucumber and celery in your body as possible, and you're going to be feeling a lot better. So as far as making that one simple change, that's definitely where I would start. And then one main thing for me, I know, is I absolutely love chocolate. And you're like, so how do you end up having chocolate? Well, chocolate actually originally comes from cacao. There's actually a cacao tree which has cacao beans, and you know, it's not like Hershey bars aren't grown on trees. They uh, <laughs> They actually come from, oh, again, nature. As you'll find, everything comes from nature. And so this is, so, this is almost the most simple recipe. Um, a couple cups of raw cacao powder, a cup of coconut oil, and all this stuff you can get at you know, Sprouts or Whole Foods or any regular grocery store. And then the original recipe in the book actually calls for agave nectar, which is still kind of high in sugar. And it actually does taste pretty good. I've had those before, but I kind of get to the point where I don't think all that sugar is necessary. And so we have 
some pretty good substitutes which work well. Uh, Lohan extract, which we actually sell through Burke Superfoods, and we may be one of the only uh, organic ones in the country. And it actually it comes from monk fruit, and it's so, it's so much sweeter than sugar. You only need like a tiny little bit, and it sweetens. It'll sweeten your entire chocolate bar. So it'll taste just like you know regular chocolate, depending on how much you put in. Uh, stevia is another possibility. I actually just like the way the Lohan tastes. I've made it with stevia before, and it's still okay. But um, for me, I think the Lohan works better for the chocolate bars. And then just a pinch of Himalayan salt. Um, or Celtic sea salt, something like that. You have some of the, honestly, the most amazing chocolate I've ever had. I've taken it to parties sometimes. Um, and actually, what you do after that is you just put it in the freezer, and it'll freeze in the bars. You can use, uh, instead of coconut oil, if you use uh, cacao, or, uh, cacao butter, then it'll actually stay solid at room temperature. Um, but it's really funny because I'll take some of these uh, so, uh, different parties, and people will be like, oh my gosh, this is the best chocolate, and not even knowing that it's like a raw, organic, vegan. Um, dish and they'll sometimes use it for dips and people will be eating like you know carrots with the chocolate and the celery and everything like that and I'm just kind of like sitting around there like laughing as the people comments and you know you tell them later on what it is and they're kind of like oh wow that's cool I never thought you know I never thought that you could do something like that so next we get to this whole big debate and I'm sure you've seen a lot of this for me personally I try to eat as much organic as possible if I have you know, a choice um, <clears throat> There's so much research on this, I don't want to get too in-depth, you can certainly do your own, but um, the pesticides and chemical fertilizers, again, are unnatural. Again, you're getting further and further away from nature. Um, so with organic, at least, natural pesticides are allowed, but no petrochemicals, so you're not going to get like a lot of oil-based stuff in there. The chemical pesticides are carcinogenic, um, and they have many studies showing that they have higher vitamin and mineral content for the organic versus the genetically modified. And the big thing, again, genetically modified, you're getting further away from nature. So you go back to my original point, you know, the nature of health. If you're eating genetically modified food, it's further away from nature the way it, was originally, the way it originally was. So if you switch over and go back towards nature, I have a good feeling, you know, you're going to feel better. You know, I tried it out. It's worked for me. Lots and lots of people that, that I know that have done the same thing. Uh, for me personally, it tastes so much better, too. Um, when I have my parents trying all this stuff, and you know, at first they think I'm crazy because I'm, you know, eating hamburgers one day and then the next the next day I'm like a raw vegan, you know, doing juicing, and they're like, "How in the world did that happen?" Um, but eventually they're noticing the same thing. They're like, "Oh, I went to the supermarket and I got organic food. It tastes so much better than the other stuff I was getting." And that's one of the main things I think is actually pretty cool that you'll notice if you're used to one kind and you switch over. Um, it definitely is better. And on that note, again, organic isn't the like the end all be all, it's still registered and done by the government, which I don't really have much trust in whatsoever. It's just a seal, but it does supposed to be non GMO, is what the organic, what the, at least for me, that's what's most important. At the end of the day, I would say grow your own food, make friends with the farmer, go to farmers markets, and know what they're doing. That's the only way you know what's, you know, what's going on. Otherwise, you know, you're getting stuff from California and Mexico, and sure, they have the organic label on it, but how do you really know? You know, if you go in your backyard and you plant carrots and cucumbers and they grow and then you pick them and you eat them, you know where they came from. And every time I've been to, we have a, a really good farmer we've worked with before. We were doing uh, some farmers markets for our patients uh, in Las Vegas, and we had a farmer in California who's just amazing. And uh, the the cost of stuff was insane. We were getting they're selling avocados at Whole Foods for two to three dollars. We were getting them for a quarter from the farmer. Because that's actually what Whole Foods is buying them for. They're paying them a quarter and selling them to you for like two or three dollars. The same thing with cucumbers and all this other stuff. So if you can find a local farmer that you know you know you trust and they'll let you go to your, their fields, you can usually get stuff so much cheaper and it's going to taste so much better too. So that's one way to make this whole idea cost effective. Um, but if you really want to get more into it, one of the best ones that I've seen is Genetic Roulette, the Documented Health Risks of Genetically Engineered Food. <coughs> Uh, by Jeffrey Smith. That's a great, uh, great film. I think you can watch it online either for free. It might be a couple of bucks now after its original one. Another thing that, again, this literally on a daily basis seriously annoys me because I go to Whole Foods and I go to Wheatsville and I'm always looking at ingredients because I want to know what I'm putting into my body. And for whatever reason, everyone loves putting this canola oil and stuff. And every time I have something, I'm like, oh, this looks cool. What is this? And I see canola oil on it, I stick it back in the refrigerator, and I'm not going to eat it. The reason why is, 
genetically modified canola oil, which almost all of it is. I know they say it's not, but it's all canola oil. It's from modified rape seeds. So the original name of this product was rape seed. They changed the name um, canola instead of rape for marketing purposes. You know, apparently people don't like buying you know oil that with the word rape in it. So let's just change the name, and you know, it's all good. And canola oil is widely used in processed food. And the study that they did, which was unbelievable, in the late 80s, they did a study where the rapeseed or the canola oil was fed to cows, pigs, and sheep. And after giving them this, they went blind and became attacking people. And I'm just like, wow. And when it got removed from their diets, it all went reversed. And I've done other research into this, you know, the canola oil, what happens when they heat and everything, and it's just something I really try to avoid. You know, it's still, it's, there's still some stuff that it's in, and it's, it's almost really hard to get away from. But I would say when having a choice, just try to avoid canola oil as much as possible compared to a sunflower oil, safflower oil, or coconut oil. There's so many other things that can be used. I just have a, a problem too that a lot of times when companies are using this, you can tell that the rest of their product is cheap because they're not going that extra length to make the product healthy for the customers as opposed to, okay, if they're using canola oil, I know they're probably skipping on other ingredients, you know. Maybe their stuff isn't organic or maybe they're not labeling it properly because if they really cared about their health, they wouldn't be using the canola oil. It's just so simple to use and so cheap that a lot of uh, companies will just use it when they're more focused on profit versus health. Uh, the next thing I like to do that, um, again, seem, I just don't see very many people doing this, but it's had such profound effects on me, is distilled water. And I, I actually chronicle this pretty good in my book with some different studies, but the idea of organic versus inorganic minerals. And so the biggest thing, uh, I personally have only drinking distilled water for over three years now. I've not touched anything else. When I go to the airport, I buy smart water, because smart water is vapor distilled. And that's literally the only thing I put into my body. I'll have uh, different types of juices and everything too, but I'm not going to be buying bottled water. It's actually a lot cheaper. I have a link on my website. You can buy a distiller for about $140. And it's lasted you know, several years. You just make your water every day from the tap water. Uh, you, know, you can distill ocean water. You can distill sewage. Uh, because all it is is that it is heated to the boiling point so impurities are separated from the water. And then what people say is, oh, you're missing out on your, your minerals. What's happening in the minerals you're getting is they're inorganic minerals. Again, these are dead minerals which end up accumulating in your body. And so if you notice, the reason why distilled water is actually still on shelves, it's not because they want people buying it, it's because you need to put distilled water in your car radiator, you need to put it in your iron, and you need to put it in other things where if you were to put the other stuff, the calcium carbonates and everything in there would form this white layer. And so if you notice when people get older, they almost look like they're being like plastered from the inside. And a lot of times that groundwater is used in plaster of Paris to make houses and everything to stick together. And so all people are doing over time by putting these inorganic minerals into their body is they're literally plasterizing themselves you know, from the inside. And I think it's, they said something by the time like you're in your mid like 40s or something like that, you've actually had to excrete a life-size replica. So say you weigh you know, 180 pounds, you've had to get 180 pounds of these minerals through your entire body, through your, you know, your kidneys and your liver and all that to filter it out. That's how much stuff is in there if you just drink normal water because you know, if you think about how much water you drink every day, how much needs to be filtered out, it's unbelievable the amount of uh, you know, damage you're doing to your, you know, your kidneys, your liver, and everything, having to filter this stuff out. And so if you want your organic minerals, one main thing, I like the Longevity ones, which they sell here, which I, think, which I think are great. And then if you're doing all your juicing, you can get all your stuff from fruits and vegetables. Um, it's really funny when I was growing up and I was doing all the crazy proteins and creatines and you know, all my stuff to be you know, the super athlete. And my mom was telling me, why are you taking all that stuff? You know, can't you get everything from the food you eat and everything? And the truth is, a lot of times, if you're eating the right food, you can get a lot of it from there. If you're doing juicing and all that, unfortunately, most people, the kind of stuff they're putting in, they're not getting any of it. But you're still not going to get it through water. You're not going to get any minerals that your body needs through the city tap water. Um, you know, what you may be getting is things like fluoride and birth control and um, a lot of other hormonal mimickers, which you can look at the studies and, you know, go do some of the testing on your water and see what's in it. Um, 
What's really interesting about the distiller is that it, uh, it puts the water out into like my glass container and inside it takes, um, so I, I make this much water and there's always this much just junk that I have to throw out and it's all the stuff that got distilled out. And so that's basically, if people are drinking you know, this much water, they're putting this much stuff in, which the distiller doesn't even want, which you know, it can't, be, can't be utilized. It's just all the impure stuff, um, which is just amazing that people are putting that much stuff into their body every day. Um, and essentially all of this is break the water down, so there's no solids, minerals, trace elements, no taste, it's just nothing. And at that point, what I do, I love putting lemon and cucumber and mint leaves and everything. You can make any taste of water you want. You know, put some strawberries in there, put uh, some orange, uh, just some of the most amazing water. I just put it in the glass container to keep filling it up. And then once a week when I do my juicing, I just replace whatever was in my glass container and I juice that and I put some more in. So, easy way to have some really great tasting water. Um, Another thing that I do is uh, a daily digestion drink. That's actually what I have right here in this. Um, and what this is, is just the distilled water that I make. It's uh, apple cider vinegar, which I really like the brags. Uh, cinnamon, which actually really helps to maintain your blood sugar levels. And I think it tastes good, actually. It uh, tastes pretty amazing with this mix. And then I usually use either stevia. You can also use the Lohan extract. Um, the liquid extract actually works pretty well. You can get that at pretty much any any store. Whole Foods has it. Sprouts. And then if you are worried about your vitamins and minerals, you can just add them back. You can buy your organic vitamins and minerals. The Longevity has a great one. You can just pour a capful in there, uh, and then you don't have to worry about not getting your minerals from that. Um, another simple thing you can do every day. And especially people that have uh, issues with, you know, with their teeth, having to go to the dentist, this works amazing. This, uh, it's the mouthwash or oil pulling. And I try to do this every day. So all you do is you take a little spoonful of coconut oil. Again, the same, just a little spoonful of baking soda. I like uh, the Bob's Red Mill one. It seems to work pretty well. It tastes good. And I just swish it around in my mouth when I'm, you know, washing up for the day or basically getting, getting ready and everything. And so you just do that. Um, and then afterwards, you want to make sure, again, spit it out, you don't want to swallow that. Um, that's definitely one thing you want to do because it's, what it's doing is pulling all the toxins out of, your, out of your mouth and your gums. And so obviously if you swallow that, it's just going to go right into your system and you're going to be essentially poisoning yourself. And a lot of people, especially if anyone has metal fillings, mercury, or they've had serious issues with, with their teeth, you'll notice right away when you put it in, um, any places where there's a, where you've had issues, you'll kind of feel like a sharp, kind of an interesting pain for like a second, and then it'll kind of go away. And what that kind of is, I've noticed, is it's actually pulling the toxins and everything out of there. And after you do that, you know, say a couple times, a couple days, or a week or so, it'll end up not hurting anymore. And so it was amazing. Again, I didn't even realize I had a, I had a family dentist who I went to for a long time. And never really had any issues whatsoever. And then I was in uh, I was in Atlanta, Georgia for school, and I hadn't seen him. So they're like, "Oh, just go see." You. I went someone local there, and they're like, "Oh, you have all these cavities. You need to get your teeth fixed and everything." And they wanted the amount they I think they wanted like ten thousand dollars or something like that. And I was like, "I don't have any issues or pain or anything. Like I think I'm just gonna wait till I see my dentist back there." And I went to see him in. I didn't have, he's like, oh, there's, a, there's not really that big of a deal. One will have to keep a look on and everything. And I was like, so these people just completely lied to me and were trying to hustle me? Just so I would like get, what, teeth surgery? They were just going to like yank out teeth, which were probably good. And I thought that was just like insane. And that's definitely one of the things that made me question, like, what are these people doing? I think the only reason why I was told the truth, because this was like a family friend, uh, you know, his daughter was the same age as my sister. And so, of course, they were being truthful. They're not trying to, you know, steal money from us, if, you know, because we'd have to see them pretty much all the time. Um, but it just amazes me what some of these medical people who have these doctors and went to school all the time, um, their, first, their first thing to do is like, okay, let's prescribe drugs and let's give surgeries, because that's their scope of practice. That's what they're allowed to do. They went to school to tell people to take drugs and to have surgery. And so... One of the things I, I like to do as far as the analogies go is, you know, if you want to go to, you know, you don't go, there's a McDonald's next door. You don't go to McDonald's and order, like, tell them I want a raw chocolate bar. They're going to think you're completely nuts. Like, what are you talking about? You want a raw chocolate bar? Like, you want to you 
you want an organic quinoa salad here? Like, what, what, is, what kind of nonsense is this? We don't sell that stuff. If you go to a Western medical doctor and you're expecting to leave that office with anything other than a prescription for drugs or a note to have surgery, again, I think you're completely crazy. That's all they do. That's like a one-stop shop for drugs and surgery. So if you want a solution to your problems, you know, you need to go to someone who has a larger scope of practice, whether it's acupuncture or it's chiropractic or Chinese medicine, you know, they have other modalities available to them to, you know, reverse your problems. And again, the same thing with this, a dentist, I, I've never been to, I was going to even, my dentist was a friend, and they don't even know about this stuff. So, again, the closer you are to nature, I mean, coconut oil, baking soda, pretty simple, you know, swishing it around in your mouth for a couple minutes a day, I mean, it's really cheap, too, if you think about the cost of this stuff. You know, you're talking maybe less than $10 for probably a month or two supply. You know, I mean, how's the dent, how's everyone in the dental, going to dental school going to pay back their student loans if you don't have to go see the dentist because you're doing something like this? So, um, just another really, uh, really simple thing I think people can make as far as a change goes. Um, and on that note, this is, a, this is a really interesting study, so just a thought to ponder as I was getting in there, the Western Medical. So Robert S. Mendelssohn, who is a medical doctor in his Confessions of a Medical Heretic, in his book, he had the following statistics concerning death rates, and this is uh, concerning a doctor's strike in Israel in 1973, okay? The doctors reduced their daily patient contact from 65,000 to 7,000. So they were seeing approximately 65,000 people per day. They dropped down to 7,000 because many of them went on strike. Uh, during that time, it lasted a month, the death rate dropped by 50%, which is like, you know, if it dropped 5% or 10%, maybe it's a statistical anomaly, but when the death rate drops by 50%, um, and considering that there had never been a dramatic decrease since 20 years before when another strike had happened, so you take those two times, the two times the doctors strike, half as many people died. So what exactly, you know, are, are the doctors being helpful and useful, or you know, maybe, maybe there's other modalities that people are forced to uh, forced to look at when, uh, you know, when they don't have that Western medical document as a, you know, as a, so, oh sorry, as a show. Um, so let me bring this up. And so this, uh, this is going to show some just interesting stuff. I'm going to transition a little bit now to like uh, athletes and how they're all doing very similar stuff in yoga. Here's a cool clip. This was my friend Mike who I worked with at Perfect Competition in Florida. Oh, that one. 